A luxury you can't live without. A luxury I can't live without. Coffee. I really like good coffee. It's not coffee. a luxury you can get it anywhere. All right, give me a luxury. Which, what luxury should I have? Private plane. Larry, I'm on DuckTales. The 2017 reboot of DuckTales was such an event when it dropped. The pilot episode premiered for a full 24 hours on Disney XD. Yeah, but what time, what time of day? When would you tune in? And I'm like, happy what? you asked. Okay. It's gonna be every single second on that day. And there were major names attached to every part of this thing. I was just super excited because I knew all of these guys before I got the job and Danny Pudi. And so I was like, I gotta get on that show. I need to be on that show. And the best part was it was clear that they were putting a lot of care into the project. They included Easter eggs out the wazoo in the pilot episode and in the series following, which just proved that they knew their stuff. They got some really good talent, a lot of which weren't just big names, but names with experience acting and voice acting. Louis is uh, Bobby Moynihan, right? Is yes. Voice? No. Louis, and then Kate McCucci plays uh, Webigail, and then David Tennant uh, plays Scrooge McDuck. As the show went on, it was clear that they had plenty of actual ideas for stories and adventures, and the love going into the show was apparent to all who cared to see it. It was an absolute ball of fun about two things, adventure and family. This show garnered so much respect, huge names were getting involved with even smaller roles. Beck Bennett plays Launchpad. Bobby Moynihan told me before my agents got to call me, so I was like, what? No. Lin-Manuel Miranda as Gizmo Duck. You do Broadway stuff? A little. They got Don Cheadle to play Donald as a bit for a couple episodes. I'm not the first person to, to, to go into duck philosophy, obviously. Danny Pudi got interviewed by Larry King, and then that became a meme, which inspired this remix. Funny. Oh. Private plane. Oh. Sucks. What? Larry, I'm on duck tail. That's gonna be the first link in the description. It was the go-to example of how to do a good reboot. It seems like it got nothing but positive reviews. It was a powerhouse that everybody loved and that everybody who worked on it seemed insanely proud of. It seems strange then, the, the reason the show ended, the reason we didn't get renewed for a fourth season, was lack of interest. Ratings were too low. It just couldn't draw the attention that it needed. Larry, I'm on DuckTales. Episode 16 of season two, The Duck Knight Returns. Our protagonist for the episode, Launchpad, learns of a reboot of an old TV show within the DuckTales universe, Darkwing Duck. Confusingly enough, also a Disney afternoon classic in the real world in which Launchpad is a central character. Seeing the trailer for the new movie immediately makes our protagonists worried. That is not Darkwing Duck. DW never heard innocent people or set the city on fire. Not on purpose. As it's being made with great tension between an overly artsy, grim vision of an auteur and the profit-driven priorities of corporation executives. In this case, Scrooge McDuck. The movie should be in color. Color's all the rage these days. The episode follows Launchpad as he goes to more and more extremes to force the reboot to be more like the original. And it hits its turning point when he meets the new actor cast to play Darkwing, Drake Mallard. He's a mega fan of the original show and even though he's working in a framework set by others, it's clear he's putting a lot of passion into the project. Look, I know this movie's not perfect, but I really want to make it better. By the end of the episode, Drake is cast as the true hero, and the old actor morphs into a supervillain, driven mad by the story he wasn't able to finish. They want grim and gritty, huh? Happy to play the part. The moral of the episode is ultimately one about giving creators the benefit of the doubt. Showrunners, actors, writers, a lot of them care very deeply about the things they make, especially if it's a reboot of some kind. They may be working in systems that restrict them or guide their ideas away from what they would like, or perhaps they're just making decisions that you personally don't agree with. But to doubt their sincere passion behind the project is simply unfair and 
frankly, unacceptable. It's easy to see how this episode reflects the show that it exists within. DuckTales 2017 was a reboot of a Disney afternoon classic that made a lot of changes and added a lot of its own flavor. And while most of the reception to the show was great, I have absolutely no doubt that the creators of this show got their fair share of flack for trying to reboot this thing. If any production team deserved to make this argument for themselves, it was this one. I want to make it clear that I do not for one moment doubt the sincere passion and creativity that went into this project. But that's not the part of this episode that I find most interesting. Toward the beginning of the episode, we get to see how the original in-universe version of Darkwing Duck ended. It was a cliffhanger set up for future seasons, which never panned out because the show was prematurely canceled. Everyone involved is absolutely distraught at it never having been finished. And this, I believe, is one of the writer's biggest fears for this series. The DuckTales 2017 crew, I am convinced would have done everything in their power to make sure that their show didn't end this way. At all costs, our show is going to have a proper ending. And that's all fine and dandy. Um, the problem comes when you already have an ending in mind, but you are not given the time you need to build to that ending. The DuckTales writers, it seems, had a pretty clear idea of where they wanted things to end up. My hunch is that they needed four seasons to get there and they only got three. The DuckTales 2017 finale is a lot. It is very much. Too much, you might say. The DuckTales finale is too much. And yet somehow also not enough in places. While it is by no means bad or even unsatisfying necessarily, it does make some big swings that for the first time in the series history don't quite pay off in their favor, in my opinion. A lot of people like this finale. For other people, me for example, it put them in a bit of a funk, incapable of thinking about the show without getting a little bit sad. It turned a show I loved into a show I chose never to revisit until I made this video. But in order to understand how hot of a mess this crash landing finale is, you first have to understand how near perfect television the majority of this show was. And in order to stress how good it is, if you think you might want to watch the show and you haven't yet, click off of this video now and go watch it. If you're currently choosing not to do that and at any point during this video I change your mind about wanting to watch this show, uh, immediately click off of this video and go watch it. It's that good. Please do come back once you're done though. I'll wait. You gone? You back? Aren't you so excited? Let's get into it. The original DuckTales 87 series is fun television. I watched most of the episodes on disc as a kid. It's a great adventure show following Scrooge McDuck, the richest duck in the world, his great nephews, and a couple of other close confidants on their various outrageous and magical quests across the world. It's got some fun characters, a great episodic structure, and not much else to worry about outside of that. DuckTales 2017 made some big changes, most notably its protagonists. While the 87 show had the triplets Huey, Dewey, and Louie as a classic indistinguishable trio, the reboot's first big move was to give them each individual personalities. Huey is the nerdy, responsible older brother. How about a nice, safe nap? Louie is the mischievous, high-maintenance younger brother. As long as you could talk, you could talk your way out. Trademark Louie Duck. And Dewey is the Ben Schwartz. How does he do it? I don't know. No? That's meant as a compliment, by the way. K to the N to the O-P-E, she's the dopest little shorty in all Pawnee, Indiana. Why don't you just stop a Pawnee? The show also flipped their obligatory token girl character, Webby, into an insane child weapon capable of murder who just wants to make friends. Wait! Are we? 
friends now? If we say yes, will you let us live? Much better than the whiny younger sister stereotype that the old show had, even if it is a little ham-fisted for my personal tastes. As far as changes for existing characters go, their reincorporation of Donald into the main plot of the show was meant with nothing but praise from most of the community. That was pretty cool! I mean, especially for you! And it really hit home that family angle that the show was going for. Villains like Magicka and Glomgold returned with an amazing amount of vigor and intrigue. You're here because you're the best of the cheapest. Side characters like Gyro and Launchpad translate excellently with minor tweaks. Get ready to pull up! Yes sir, random kid I just met! And even incidental characters like Jin carry over beautifully. Anyone else wish to test me on my birthday? Uh -oh. Happy birthday, dude! It really feels like every element of these characters had somebody actively thinking about how they fit into the world. Take Mrs. Beakley, for example. In the original show, she was the housekeeper and Webby's grandmother. Both remain true in the reboot. However, here it's casually thrown in that she's also a spy, with a history of working with Scrooge for Shush. Oh, simple. I'm a spy. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes a lot of sense considering Scrooge's adventuring background, that he would not only want the people closest to him to be people with skills that parallel him, but who have a history with him and so he knows can put up with his eccentricities. And they do this with most all of the characters. Anybody who gets wrapped into Scrooge's inner circle has to be eccentric in their own way. The life of adventure follows him home. His butler is also a ghost. His company CEO used to work for Shush as well. His head researcher brought on board because he's borderline a supervillain. How shall you? I'll show you all! And maybe wait until you're out the room to see that next time. It really just makes the world feel cohesive, as well as giving each of your characters a real sense of history. It's just little touches like that, which not only respect the source material, but expand on it in a way that makes the reboot feel unique and layered. It's not just good reboot writing, it's, it's just good writing period. And as if that wasn't enough, the show is able to introduce its own great original characters. Mark Beeks is a very cringe villain, but th that's the point and I kind of can't get enough of him. My hot new software update is guaranteed to reduce the chance of your Waddle phone catching fire by a jaw-dropping 7%, bringing it down to a solid 50-50. Lena, while loosely inspired by a DuckTales comics character, is largely her own thing with a really interesting mystery which adds nicely to the first season. This is a party? All the best parties are at burnt out junkyards. Manny, the headless man horse, just a straight up relatable guy. And of course, Della Duck. One of the biggest swings this show makes is answering the most obvious question around the triplets. Why exactly is Donald the one raising them? This show takes this kind of unnecessary lore question and turns it into the catalyst for the starting status quo of the show. Mom? A mystery for the first season and a bulk of the plot for the second until we get to the point where Della, the mother of the triplets, is seamlessly integrated into the main cast for the third season. It's just a mosquito! You should give it some of your blood! I'm getting ahead of myself. The pilot episode, which you should go watch, it's on YouTube, is fantastic. The pace and manner at which it gives us character and expositional information is expert. The triplets find out they're related to Scrooge, who has historically been known as a great adventurer. Uncle Scrooge! <laughs> <laughs> but then we see him, and he's all closed off and miserly. There's some sort of rift between him and the rest of the family. Why? We don't know. But he starts to open up over the course of the story, even embracing his family by the end. Mind you, we still don't know the reason for that initial divide, and that underlying tension sits through the remainder of the first season. It's so good, you guys! We can explain. We came down to your secret museum to look for you because we 
love you. It's such a solid pilot. I'm surprised how little there is to criticize about it. There's only like one side plot in the second half that feels a little bit pointless, but it's still fun. Lying, it's the responsible thing to do. And the ending setting up the Della thread that'll take us through the rest of the show is an excellent stinger. The rest of the first season plays out with only a few episodes that I don't love to death. The Funzo's episode feels a little bit stiff, but so do most episodes that immediately follow the pilot. I don't really feel like we needed the hidden civilization that worships a false god trope, although I do like a couple of the twists on that premise that they implement. Some people even put french fries in their burritos. This is the dumbest rebellion I have ever been part of. And you'll forget all about them when the other episodes are The Great Dime Chase, Mystery at McDuck Manor, The Secrets of Castle McDuck, The Other Bin of Scrooge McDuck. Maybe I just like episodes with McDuck in the title. Each of which have really interesting plot lines that are executed brilliantly. Just look at The Day of the Only Child for an example. The setup is that the triplets have a day where they all pretend to be an only child. Thank you, good Samaritans. You restored my faith in the kindness of random strangers. And each have their own adventure that somehow goes horribly wrong and they all end up intersecting in one central location. This episode has a cliffhangers which converge and resolve each other vibe going for it, which is insanely satisfying to watch. I guess Only Child Day wasn't an absolute disaster after all. You should go check it out. That episode is actually on YouTube. The show also does a great job at balancing its comedic and dramatic tendencies. The other bin of Scrooge McDuck, I think is a great example of this. The A-plot has some really cool visual depictions of the inner workings of the mind of one of our characters. And then our B-plot has this hilarious subversion of a trope that I, and I think a lot of other people absolutely cannot stand, which makes it so enjoyable. Bye. Tenderfeet, I love you. Have fun living in the gross woods and not our awesome mansion anymore. And both of these plots are sort of tangentially connected through Scrooge's paranoia, which walks the line between them and serves to unify them. It feels like it all fits and this heavy dramatic stuff and this comedic plot line pair together really well. Ah, Bigfoot, I knew that was something strange. Effort. You should go watch that episode too. It is also on YouTube. This season is also really good at embracing its ensemble cast in some really fun ways. Not every character is in every episode, and while there are some standard pairings like all of the kids or Dewey and Webby as adventuring buddies, they're not afraid to break those default groups either. Unlike other shows. The infernal internship of Mark Beeks is just interested in the Huey Dewey dynamic, so Louie isn't even in this episode. And it ends up being a great one. Where did you get a briefcase full of money? Next to the suit of armor in the billionaire's club. That place needs better security. You should go watch it. It's on YouTube. When we get to the first episode of the season one finale, we get a team up between Webby and Launchpad. A duo I had not considered but instantly wanted to see more of. Their unique combination of overactive child in an adult's body and extremely sheltered ball of aggressive good intentions pairs especially well. Okay, okay, one of us needs to stay calm here. So, you? We get Huey working with the Beagle Boys, which turns out surprisingly wholesome, and Beakley antagonizing Lena because she assumes she's a bad influence is a great plot line I was not expecting. Important to note, the pilot episode focuses pretty heavily on Dewey, taking him as sort of our point of view character and singling him out in the finale. This is a surprisingly insightful death trap. The overarching plot of the first season is also focused on him trying to uncover the mystery of what happened to his mother. That's right, DuckTales is following in the footsteps of my other favorite animated kids show about color-coded children who get roped into adventuring thanks to an old man. This ensemble show has focused Focus seasons. So this is our Dewey season. He ropes Webby into his quest to find out what happened to his mom, but otherwise keeps his investigation on the down low. His progression this season involves dissecting why it is that he's keeping things so quiet and learning to grow past his hangups around the whole situation. It's honestly really sweet. Eventually, his brothers get clued into the whole situation after this heart-wrenching emotional breakdown, which absolutely shook me to 
my core the first time I saw it and deserves to be seen in its full context. And everything comes to a head in the episode before the finale, The Last Crash of the Sun Chaser, which literalizes the eggshells that everybody is walking on surrounding the family drama by putting them on this plane, balancing precariously on the top of a mountain. I cannot stress enough how viscerally high the stakes feel this whole episode, and how expertly the buildup throughout the season primes you for the emotional explosion at the end of this episode. This ending montage bit somehow wasn't originally planned to be in the episode, but I'm glad it is because it's maybe the best thing in the show? If you are not physically shaken by the time you reach the end, I don't know what's wrong with you. It's so good. You should go watch it. It's on YouTube. The finale is a bit more disconnected from the family drama thread. Instead, it focuses on our second mystery, this new character, Lena, and her connection to Magicka Dispel, a favorite villain from the old show. See, Webby befriends this edgy teenage duck who it just so happens is actually the shadow spy of Scrooge's greatest enemy, who she has a fairly abusive relationship with. My aunt is mad, mad, mad that I haven't checked in with her. I got to go. Well, come on then, lass. Let's get you home to your family. We get to see her wrestle with her allegiances throughout the season, and her progression is pretty fun to watch. No! Family is supposed to help you, not hold you hostage. Turns out the literal magical power of friendship helps Lena to sever herself from her creator. That's so sweet. We love to see it. I love this kid's show literalizing the magic of friendship. All of this results in this giant shadow battle inside a destroyer destroyed money bin, crazy magic, plane crashes, everybody gets to help out. We get that Don Cheadle cameo. I am the storm. No, seriously, have you been saying things like that this whole time? And most importantly, the reconciliation of the family, which Dewey is most adverse to at first, but is most committed to after the flip. Ducks don't back down. See, I told you it's a thing cooler when he does it. And then boom, Della Duck is still alive on the moon cliffhanger. Boys? Absolutely nailing that ending stinger yet again. Excellent season. You can pinpoint exactly the stories that they wanted to tell and they told them. I mean, just this whole first season is ridiculously well constructed. You should go watch it. It's on YouTube. That's right, the entire first season of this stellarly written show, which will make you both laugh and cry, is available for free on YouTube. You should go watch it. That's gonna be the second link in the description. Second season starts off with this great episode centered on Louie. New season, new focus duck, makes sense. Louie is just in the adventuring game for the treasure, not really the adventure. There is no treasure of Mount Neverest. Nope, Louie out, already gone. Have fun. And this makes him feel at odds with everybody else who has actual adventure relevant skills. And this first episode fabulously displays his desperation to escape adventure in a household which is a high powered magnet for it with the inclusion of a shrink ray which reveals the existence of many civilizations inside of the mansion itself. We'd never get a break. Even when we were home, we would just keep on adventuring. The episode, which is just supposed to be your basic family game night, turns into this life or death situation for everybody. Careful, you'll crush them! They're already crushed! <laughs> Why? By the end of the episode, Scrooge tells Louie that his superpower is essentially that he's a smart aleck and he can sense a scam and see all the angles. The ability to read a situation and see all the shortcuts and the possibilities. Your mother could do it. So can you. This sets Louis on the path of starting a company this season and also his arc of proving that he has value to his family while also learning not to flaunt his talents. One little thing that I noticed is that before we get into the whole you can see all the angles phase this season, we actually get some pretty clear hints at it last season. There's this one episode where he's noticing these horror film tropes play out in a scenario that's unfolding around them. Rock! 
that suddenly disappeared. Ooh, nice twist. Like, that's just a throwaway gag, but it leads directly into the main plot for season two. Whoa, some cool hidden city or treasure or whatever. Wait, what? That cool thing is dangerous or cursed or guarded by centaurs? Ah! Louis almost dies. Can we please move it along? That's how it goes. It's so good. The lead up to the finale sees Louis outsmart Scrooge and all of his enemies himself becoming the richest duck in the world. And then paying the consequences for it. I have worked hard for three whole months. I deserve this. In general, I think this season is probably my favorite. Maybe because I am most definitely a Louis, but also largely, I think just because it is the second season. We've already done the legwork of setting up characters and character dynamics. So this season, the writers really just get to have fun with all of the pieces that they've set in place. You can have an episode that's largely dedicated to dissecting the mind of one of the show's most iconic villains. Have a time travel Christmas episode. An episode that's just a walkthrough of all of the kids' dreams. This is in all my dreams. I'm like cradled <laughs> by a moon made of my own tears. Who knows what that's about? A flashback story time episode complete with Princess Bride style interruptions. Of course. Nope. Gross, old people romance, Blech. This is also the season where we get that Darkwing meta episode that we talked about earlier. My favorite episode that probably wouldn't have been possible last season is the 87 cent solution, which sees Scrooge go insane and die. How much to that? Oh no. This results in probably the hardest laugh I've gotten out of the show. It's the musical cue if you've seen it, you know. And even the episodes with a more railed-in concept are still fantastic. The Curious Case of Gandra D has a delightful Huey and Webby team up. Is this spaghetti tied together? You're supposed to eat it, then meet in the middle for a kiss. And I'll be ready to capture the tender moment. End of the night, we hand out souvenir photos. I love to see children attempt romance when they know nothing about it. It's good stuff. Treasure of the Found Lamp has an absolutely heartwarming moral about the value of family history. And Happy Birthday Doofus Drake introduces another in the lineup of fictional robots that I stan. Hi, I'm Boyd, a definitely real boy. It's probably here that I should also mention that this show goes out of its way to rope in a lot of the extended Disney universe in some pretty interesting ways. There's some pretty easy crossover. We already talked about the Darkwing stuff, but over the course of the show, we also get to see the Tailspin cast, the Three Caballeros, Daisy is here, the Rescue Rangers somehow show up. We get a Quack Pack episode. Mickey manifests hilariously in a way I refuse to spoil. And somehow we even got the gummy bears in here. They'll be here and there and everywhere. Mass destruction that's beyond compare. And for the most part, the show does a pretty good job of working them in pretty naturally. The three caballeros introduced this season are Donald's college band in this universe. And the episode they first appear in takes that setup and uses it to dissect the pressures of doing something meaningful with your life that reconnecting with old friends brings with it. I'm connecting with my wife. Oh, that never bothered you before. Not only is it fun for audience members who already know who these characters are, but it also makes for a good story for audience members who don't. It's fan service that, importantly, doesn't get in the way of the storytelling. In fact, most references that the show makes are completely invisible to viewers who don't know about them. One that I happened to notice was that since the triplets in this version got individual voices, their usual uniform voice doesn't get utilized anywhere. Yeah, double yeah, yeah, like they said. Until we get a flashback episode featuring young Donald and younger Donald's voice is the typical uniform voice of the triplets. So furry, furry, furry up here! I thought that was really clever. And if you don't know it's there, it doesn't detract from your experience at all. It's not taking up unnecessary space. And there are a ton of little touches like that all throughout the background of the show. The secondary plot this season that ties into the finale is Della, who it turns out has been trying to get off of the moon for years now. Whatever happened to Della Duck is a fantastic backstory episode that does a good job of quickly endearing you to 
this new character, even when she has nobody to bounce off of, which is a very tall order. That's day 192. The gum has not yet lost its flavor. Della eventually runs into a secret race of moon people who help her repair her rocket and get back to Earth. There's this great evolving relationship between her and this moon warrior Penumbra. Forced to be roommates, we're a classic odd couple. I don't know what that is. Who goes from hating her to being, in the end, her one defender when everybody turns on her. Character arc, we love to see it. And I could nitpick Della's arrival back to her family, but all things considered, they do a fantastic job here. Who's the cyborg? Is that? It can't be. Guys. I think that's your mom. They even hit on the very real growing pains that bringing a parent back into your life involves. You've got to give her time to figure out who she is and how she fits into this family. I also really appreciate how varied all of the brothers' responses are. Dewey, obsessed with the mystery of his mother last season, here idolizes her as the best thing that could ever happen to his life. She is the best person alive! Huey is probably the most aware that she's going to need some time to learn how to parent and is seemingly most concerned with how to make things feel easier for her. She's trying and that's what matters! And, keeping with the theme of the season, Louie is having the hardest time adapting to the idea of having a mom, and so his turnaround involves more of an arc. I've gone so long without a mom, I guess I don't really know how to have one. I when we get to the finale, we even get this scene where Louie is the one to reach out to his mom mom to reaffirm their connection. It's like a it's cute flip in the dynamic there. Character progression. We love it. But you can't plan for everything. Sometimes a robot boy uses you as a pinata. I think I'm losing the thread here. Plot-wise, it turns out the main moon dude sucks and wants to invade Earth. Go figure. The season finale is a giant moon versus Earth showdown where everybody gets roped in, even the villains, to help defend the Earth against the moonlanders who want to use giant rockets to get the Earth to revolve around the moon. Gyro, it's time. Unleash the unstoppable. The Moonlanders, um, already found that and stopped it. What? I cannot convey to you how wild it gets. Elaborate tricks, surprising team-ups, shocking twists, sharkas. Is that shark wearing a parka? I call it a sharka. Space battle to blow up evil general guy. Penumbra coming in clutch to save the day. And then boom, end of season cliffhanger revealing that Scrooge's CEO Bradford is secretly evil and working for Fowl. Not as solid an end tease, I don't think, but still an exciting prospect. I mean, these guys have been around since the pilot episode, so that's some insane planning right there. Season three, if you you've been following the trend, starts out with an episode focused on Huey. So, Huey season right? This episode follows Huey's relationship with the Junior Woodchucks, a Boy Scout style organization in the Duckverse, and an excuse for the triplets in the old show to know whatever information the plot pleases. In the reboot, it serves mainly to characterize Huey, and the Junior Woodchuck guidebook serves as a physical representation of his knowledge. This episode sees him participating in a graduation tournament sort of thing against Violet, another character that the reboot introduced, in addition to Webby's girl group and a logic-driven bookworm who has recently been awakened to the world of magic since the season one finale. Well, Lena told me that friendly smack talk is expected in competitions such as these. Call him a clown! Clown! And it's when faced with Violet this episode that Huey gets bested in book smarts for probably the first time in his life and goes a little insane because of it. The Junior Woodchuck Guidebook in your mind. I'm here to help you out, teach you a thing or two about nature and yourself. Uh huh. In the end, Violet is able to help him understand that she too has worked hard to get to this point and has failed numerous times to get this far, which helps Huey to accept failure as a part of his own learning process. I will take my failure badge, please. Here, take one of mine. It's a good episode doesn't really set up a Huey arc for the rest of the season. It's 
pretty self-contained. It does give him a cool list of fetch quests for the family to go on throughout the season, so there's that. In general, I think season three is definitely the most chaotic. If season two was the writers getting to use the pieces they have in some fun ways, season three is the writers getting to use those pieces however the heck they feel like it. Like, we just straight up get an episode of a Quack Pack reboot. Cuss me! Back on the moon. That's how he do it! I'm not a spy! Everyone stop catchphrasing! James Bond film starring Smart Launchpad, Ocean's Eleven, but Louie, Astro Boy homage that's in way too deep. My bike thing? May I borrow one? Thank you! Just straight up pro wrestling. And that's just the first half of the season. I love a lot of these episodes. Rumble for Ragnarok brings back sports commentary Huey and Launchpad. Oh my! Dewey's absorbed that beard energy! Which is a great throwback to one of my favorite season one gags. Glomgold now very obviously switching the official coin for one that has heads on both sides. Very sneaky. He tosses the double-headed coin and Glomgold has called Tails. It also gives us Scrooge as a heel, which I did not know I needed as much as I did. Hey, 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 give me a hand, <laughs> I'm the richest duck in the world and you're not. <laughs> Louis Eleven introduces Daisy into the show. I love the little subversion they do when Donald first sees her. You think they're gonna do a love at first sight thing, but then they pull a full 180 and he just shrugs her off at first. <laughs> This episode also builds on a very minor character in an unexpected way, which I absolutely love. Jane is a waitress at this kid's spot called Funzo's in season one. Very incidental character. Jenny. It's Jane. Two seasons later, she comes back as part of the Louis Eleven crew, and we get this little aside. I'm using the money for college. I don't want to be at Funzo's forever. Why not? You just get that little tidbit, but from that, she's so instantly interesting and layered. I want to know more about her, which probably shouldn't be the case for this throwaway background character. But as good as all of that is, because this season has such varying concepts for episodes, it definitely feels a little less cohesive. We don't really have an arc that Huey is going through this season, so we can't exactly use that as a through line. And the only major plot thread we're given is a fetch quest. So this season just ends up feeling less satisfying as you go through it than the other two. The closest thing we get to any kind of a Huey arc is in the split sword of Swanston team, where he and Lena are teamed up to find a portion of this sword, and when they're cornered by a bad guy, Lena brings them into a liminal space in Huey's mind to figure out how they might be able to win. The solution ends up being yet another callback to season one, the Duke of Making a Mess. A throwaway joke that Huey makes once while going a little crazy because things aren't logical. Look at me, everybody, now I'm the Duke of making a mask! This is a real weird point to bring back. I guess the lesson is that Huey needs to let his anger out so that he can hulk out into a superhero alter ego? I don't know. It's a fine concept for a one-off episode, I guess. They also kind of touch on it in a previous episode, which is what makes me think that maybe this was supposed to be the Huey arc. But it certainly doesn't feel like an arc like the other two triplets had. Like, it's not established in that first episode. It's only touched on maybe twice. Worst of all, I feel like this season definitely loses some momentum as it goes on. The first adventure is just there to establish lore for the finale, and it feels entirely unnecessary. I mean, the concepts they have here aren't the most interesting. The fight for Castle McDuck is a very strange location reuse that I do not think we needed to revisit. How Santa Stole Christmas in in keeping with the theme is entirely unnecessary. It kind of ruins a great ongoing joke they had, and it's definitely the least of the Christmas specials. Beaks in the Shell is a pretty good episode. I especially like the Huey and Louie bit that they do here. Red nephew, red nephew. <gasps> 
great nephew. It's great to see them keep up with continuity like that. And then the last two episodes before the finale are an extended tailspin reference and a bottle episode with just Louie and Scrooge. I just, I have to point back to the last crash of the Sun Chaser. It's so good. And that's where you set the bar. Tell me about the Spear of Selene. And this is where we're at now. Owning up to your mistakes can be hard, but taking responsibility is the right thing to do. Like the mistake you made by buying me a Gribble in the first place. I'm not too sure what it is you think you're doing here. And then we get to the finale. Look, the finale starts off great. The whole crew, and I mean the whole crew, is at Funzo's for Webby's birthday party, which also just so happens to be Fowl's secret base. All these little interactions up front are real cute. I think we can handle a little cake. We break into an action sequence, which is pretty fun. There's this dramatic reveal of the empty table, which is cool. But then we get our first big bump in the road, May and June. We see these two little duck girls in classic clone type clone tanks. Turns out these are clones of Webby. And before we get too far into this concept, I just need to establish one thing up front. These girls are annoying. Hi, I'm May and this is June. Their voices are annoying. Oh my gosh, Webby! Their interactions are annoying. Oh, Juice! I love Juice! Their whole vibe is just ultra annoying. But now we're here with you! So that's where I stand on these characters. <laughs> For those who don't know, April, May, and June are another set of triplets, this time Daisy's nieces. They're sort of the female counterbalance to Huey, Dewey, and Louie, and just as underdeveloped. They're not a very prominent aspect of the Duckverse, so you'd be forgiven for not knowing who they are. Needless to say though, um, they were not clones. Cloning is a pretty solidly sci-fi topic. And maybe this sounds weird for a show that last season fought the moon, but DuckTales doesn't feel very sci-fi to me. I don't know, it's just sci-fi as a genre has a different tonal feel to it. And I feel like DuckTales has tone vibes that don't align with it, even if it does cover subject matter that's typically covered by sci-fi. I don't know. I think the tone genre wise is a little off. Maybe that's just me. More solidly though, the clone reveal comes seven minutes into our finale. I don't know about you, but that seems a little soon to me. That seems like a midpoint kind of reveal, right? Especially for a move which has no foreshadowing, no buildup, no tone setting. It just smacks us right in the face. I think I can more concretely say that the placing of the clone reveal and the lack of buildup was a bad storytelling move. The next few minutes of the episode are spent following everybody around as they wonder, why would Fowl clone Webby? Why would Fowl clone Scrooge's housekeeper? granddaughter. And I get that it would be impossible for these characters to deduce the actual explanation that this show has in store for us, but I mean, come on, it's Webby. This entire show has been building up Webby's capabilities as an insane living weapon. She's like the prime candidate to clone if that's what you're looking for. Come on guys, it's not that hard. Anyway, the first episode in this three episode finale is spent introducing us to these new characters. Well, June, we're locked in but at least this room's bigger than the tubes. Showing everybody reacting to these new characters, having a little plot about how we shouldn't assume they're evil just because they're from Fowl. And then it turns out they actually totally are evil. We wanted you to be our sister. Why'd you have to make it so difficult? And Webby has to process learning who they are, wanting to talk to them, getting to talk to them, becoming sisters with them, and then getting betrayed by them. All after the seven minute mark, in the episode. So we've got a good chunk of our finale dedicated to these new annoying characters and everybody's reactions to them, which astoundingly 
Nobody is annoyed. This jaunt around the house making small talk with these characters. I mean, it all just feels so fillery. Like one of those weird episodes where the writers are running out of ideas. So they introduce a one-off character who never comes back after the end of the episode and the fandom instantly forgets. Yeah, that episode is the intro episode to our finale. Like I can't possibly stress enough how bad of an idea this was. You've got 60 minutes to close out this gigantic, monumental, acclaimed series with this large ensemble cast and a huge number of other secondary side characters, each of whom is someone's favorite and is fighting for the very limited and precious screen time in this conclusion. To choose to spend nearly a third of that time on brand new characters and not even interesting ones at that absolutely baffling me. And yeah, these guys aren't interesting. The whole gimmick is that May and June are exactly like Webby. Outside of being secretly evil, their personalities are essentially exactly the same. What's our blood type? What's our favorite color? Ooh, have you eaten a hamburger? Meaning we're not even spending time on characters who have something new to bring to the table. The first thing everybody praised this show for was giving the triplets individual identities. And the show is ending by giving giving us a set of samey, indistinguishable triplets. What happened? Outside of the demon twins, uh, I guess it's not all that bad. We get this very cute scene of Webby asking Beakley about her parents, and it's simple, but I think it's really effective. I was so caught up in my spy work that I missed everything important. I didn't even know I had a granddaughter until, until it was too late and they were gone. And the ending definitely leaves you excited. Beakley knocks out Scrooge in order to handle the clone situation on her own. Webby gets kidnapped by May and June and Huey follows them. And the next episode has this recap that pays off the Junior Woodchuck guidebook expertly. How do you know Huey's gone? He left this. Although it does turn out that Beakley doesn't really do much when she goes rogue. She just kind of gets to the location a little bit earlier. So that major cliffhanger feels a little invalid in hindsight. They found all the screws knocked out! Beakley went rogue. The second episode is by far my favorite, probably because there's the least amount of May and June in it. Everybody is headed to the Library of Alexandria, which was recently uncovered by Fowl. We get the reveal that our main vulture guy, Bradford, was actually the first Junior Woodchuck because his grandmother was the founder and she's the one who made the fetch quest list that they've been using throughout the season. Isabella Finch was your grandma? Bradford tries to manipulate Huey into helping him by getting Webby to help him. Perhaps you can get through to her. You're the most logical, intelligent member of the family. He wants to catalog all of the adventure stuff to like, I guess keep it safe is what he's telling people. But then Huey sees his family trapped in a bunch of boxes and they tell him actually Bradford sucks. He's lying. He wants to destroy everything and he hates the woodchucks. So don't trust him actually. Bradford is collecting artifacts because he wants to rid the world of anything adventurous. But then he just gets trapped as well. So. Hat nephew, did you get away? That's the Huey arc. Hope you liked it. In all honesty, the moments leading up to his capture actually do play well. This is a good scene here. It just all ends so anticlimactically. We then get this sort of Mr. Incredible at the computer style sequence with Webby, who has broken out and disguised herself as June. And she's looking for information about herself and or the other two. Why did they clone Webby? And for as dramatic as they're making this scene, it feels pretty unearned. Webby has been looking for answers about the clones for all of like one day. I mean, just think back to Dewey's big moment on the cusp of finding out information about the big family mystery. That had a season worth of buildup along with one of the best episodes in the show to back up its emotional weight. And this doesn't come anywhere close to that level. One of the villains, Heron, walks in on her doing this and her cover isn't blown, but she is taken away and we get this honest pretty interesting setup. Webby, disguised as June, is made to interrogate Mrs. Beakley, who doesn't know that it's her. I'm not gonna front. 
That's a clever story move. And by interrogating her grandmother, she learns that she was also, originally, a foul experiment of some kind. The first in the series involving May and June. April. Beakley stole her as a baby after she found her on a mission, and we get this whole animated sequence of weapon baby spy adventures in top secret laboratories, and I don't know, I, I think I like the original talk with Mrs. Beakley a lot better. I don't think you need a whole flashback sequence. I think just seeing her facial expressions and her emotions as she tells the story is more than enough. And guess what? The backstory that doesn't have evil organizations creating genetic clones as a prominent feature is weirdly more relatable and endearing. Not getting to see the whole picture gives us more information about her relationship to it. Your mother was an artist. Your father was a librarian and by all accounts a very nice man. Like, that's instantly heart-wrenching to me. Additionally, the twist about Webby being April is cool, if you know your duck lore, and it feels like they're kind of banking on the idea that most of the audience will be at least passively familiar with the concept of the girl triplets. That's how you get the biggest reaction out of this scene right here. Welcome home, April. But... That doesn't really feel like fair game to me. April, May, and June are not well known. It's not like the Daisy subversion where Donald initially shrugs her off. In that instance, I do think it is fair to assume that most people understand that Donald Duck and Daisy Duck are typically in a romantic relationship. Webby being revealed to be April is just fan service for fan service's sake. It's for Duckverse nerds, and that's fine. I'm sure this would make a great fanfic concept, but as far as the show and the elements that have been set up in the show, this is not at all earned. With the other Disneyverse references in the show, it's either explicitly explained, like the Darkwing stuff, so that everybody can understand what's going on, or it doesn't affect the plot in any sort of a meaningful way. This twist about Webby is the focal point that the majority of the climax of the show revolves around. That is not where your cutesy little references belong. That should be for things that are like in the show, you know? In the, in the three seasons of show that we've had up to this point. Anyway. Last episode of the finale. The rest of the kids crash the plane, so everybody has officially arrived at the library. Webby is taken to retrieve the Papyrus of Binding, which was set up earlier in the show to only be retrievable by the true heir of Scrooge McDuck. I ask that you be lost once more until the rightful heir of Scrooge McDuck can find your final resting place. Bradford gets Webby to do this by promising that she's getting answers about who she is. Now, you may be thinking, Hold on, how is Webby Scrooge's heir? Is this gonna turn into a cutesy literalized lesson about how you get to choose your family and so the magic recognizes Webby as a McDuck in that sense? I don't know, but that does sound pretty logical to me. That sounds like a good way to pay off this thread that ties back into the themes of the show. Wouldn't that be great if, if that's how this resolved? in a way that wasn't dumb. We cut to a scene where Bradford uses the sword of Swanstantine, which like brings out your inner true self or whatever, and he turns into a straight up supervillain. And just like any bad finale, this is where we get our obligatory, I was actually responsible for the initial conflict of the show the whole time, reveal. How do you think Della found out you built the Spear of Selene? That's right, they Great Devourer overlorded it. It was I who corrupted the Great Devourer and set him against you. You? I, I mean, the Overlord Bradforded it. This came out before the Ninjago finale, but you get what I'm going with here. You? At least he doesn't misgender Della, huh? Unless you have actual hints and build up pointing towards this idea from the very beginning, this move ends up feeling real cheap. And it usually plays better as a dramatic irony move anyway. There's a bunch of scenes of various groups freeing each other and then immediately getting trapped again. At one point, there's mind-controlled versions of other villains that get thrown into the mix 
brakes for like half a second, sure. But importantly, we reach our low point. Everyone is captured in different locations and most people are pretty discouraged. And it's here that it's revealed that the reason Webby was able to retrieve the papyrus is that Webby is a clone of Scrooge. So, yeah. Bradford needed Scrooge's descendant, so he made one. Webby is Scrooge's daughter? Bless me, bagpipes. Look, I know that sounds pretty out there, but let's not look at this as a shark jump, not as a overcomplicated twist, an over clever writer move. Let's just take it as it is. Webby is a clone of Scrooge McDuck. First off, does this imply trans Scrooge McDuck? Maybe. Second, a lot of people have argued that this twist sort of invalidates the family angle that this show has been going for. DuckTales has always stressed the idea that family is the people who care for you, and that absolutely includes people outside of your biological ties, and it doesn't necessarily include people who you are biologically related to. Webby has always been included in Scrooge's family, despite not knowing about the biological connection. I think this seems like a pretty reasonable criticism to make. If you really value found family, maybe don't give the primary character that holds that title secret biological ties. Others have argued, hey, this message doesn't invalidate any of those messages. This show is also about celebrating heritage. Why can't we have both? Webby has this big speech in the final episode about how family is who you choose. Family are the people who stick by you, fight for you, blindly invade a sinister villain's secret stronghold for you. So you can't say that this twist is negating the found family message. And I would agree that this twist doesn't somehow undo all of the found family messaging that has been built up throughout the show. But it certainly doesn't add any support to it. They had to give Webby that found family speech to make sure the message wouldn't be lost. Because the storytelling in these episodes certainly wasn't gonna convey that idea on its own. Bloodline is overly emphasized in these last couple episodes. Between trying to figure out who's a clone of who and the papyrus of binding only being found by the true McDuck heir and even Bradford being the grandson of Isabella Finch. It's everywhere! For a show that wants this ultra-inclusive definition of family and wants it to be a central pillar in its messaging, I mean, it's straight up worse than the Fast and the Furious in here. I don't have friends. I got family. This finale seems to be emphasizing all the wrong things. Again, it does not cancel out this message that they want to convey, but it does not help to convey that message by any stretch of the imagination. And the focus that this puts on not only Webby, but the Webby-Scrooge dynamic for the finale just feels very strange to me. The Webby-Scrooge dynamic is an important part of the series, but by no means is it the most important one. We had, I think, exactly one episode dedicated entirely to their dynamic, and it's not like a super common theme throughout the rest of the series. It's also weird that the finale is largely dedicated to Webby. Don't get me wrong, Webby's a main character, she is a part of that top five. It's Scrooge and the kids. That's the core dynamic of the show. Webby is a main character. She is not the main character. There's no reason the finale shouldn't have been about the dynamic between Scrooge and the kids. You know, all of the main characters. And yes, let's address the elephant in the fandom. The setup of this show was a trio of brothers and also this other girl who is also there and is their same age go on adventures and live in close quarters with each other. There was shipping. There was always going to be shipping. There was no way there was ever not going to be shipping. And honestly, there were a couple of times where the show really didn't help. Shipping the boys with Webby was a sizable portion of the fandom. I don't want to overstate it. It wasn't miraculous. It's the same ship! What are you talking about? No, it's not! But, you know, fandoms 
be shipping. The biggest ship by far was Debigail. It was probably the most popular because Dewey and Webby in show did get paired up a lot and were self-described super close best friends. But Luby, the ship between Louie and Webby, whose main appeal was the streetwise guy and the naive girl, also had its fair share of shippers. And let's not forget about Huey and Webby. Us Huey people, we, we may have been few in numbers, but we... <laughs> We made our presence known. Yes, even I was not immune to the pull of the ships. Even I, like I'm good at not shipping people. Of course, this whole segment of the fandom collapsed in spectacular fashion once we reached the twist in the final episode of the whole series. And that's the thing, you know? A lot of people had a part of their experience with this show tied to those ships. They put effort into making fan art or writing fan fiction or just interacting with a community of people who shipped the same thing they did. And when the very last episode of the whole show pulls the rug out from under you and taints all of those interactions with, oh, it was incest the whole time, it kind of makes you lose interest in the show. It forces you as a fan to distance yourself from your relationship with the show. That shouldn't be what a finale does to its fans. Even if they originally planned to have this twist ending, I don't know why you wouldn't pull the plug after the first season and the shipping had already so clearly flourished. Or at the very least, do the twist sooner so that the fandom has time to adjust. It's not even like you're losing that much. Again, this twist didn't really have any buildup and only really affects the last little bit of the show. Some people might try and defend the showrunners and say like, hey, they were calling Webby part of Scrooge's family the whole runtime of the show. So really, it's your fault. You should have seen this coming. And like, no, Scrooge considers Freaking everyone, his family. Lena is his family. Launchpad is his family. Gyro is his family. Family is not a particularly high bar to clear in this show. My family. All of them. And I get it, it's a kids adventure show. There wasn't gonna be shipping between any of these kids even if they weren't related because that's just not the vibe the show is going for. That's fine. But fandom is going to fandom. They are going to take content that wouldn't fit in the show tonally and make it as fan works. Shipping is just a part of fandom culture. It's going to happen. I don't know how you didn't see the bomb before you started building it. I don't know. I, I am just of the opinion that if you have the power to help your fandom avoid accidentally shipping incest, you should. Maybe that's just me. Lucky for me, Hubie was not my main ship. I was largely a Doolit shipper, Dewey and Violet. Just in general. In the future of Duckverse content, I feel like DuckTales 2017 will have repercussions. For example, any future depiction of Della Duck now has a template to work off of. And while the nuances of the Della that we see in this show might be lost in future depictions, I'd see no reason why they wouldn't utilize pieces of her character design that was introduced here. I also find it likely that she remains a pilot in future adaptations a nice little parallel to her brother being a sailor. I also find it more likely than not that she remains an amputee. Now that it's been added into her character, it feels weird if you take it away. Webby being a clone of Scrooge, on the other hand, I don't think that's showing up again. The finale reaches its end as Webby gives that speech about found family and convinces May and June to turn good and release the people that they have captured. Launchpad gets to use the gizmo duck armor to free everybody else. Everybody rushes to go catch up to Scrooge and Bradford who has him cornered. He wants him to sign this magical contract, which is why he needed the Papyrus of Binding, which says that if he wants to save his family, he must give up adventuring forever. As long as you agree, to never adventure again. Scrooge signs in order to keep Bradford from immediately killing Donald, but then the rest of the crew barges in. Webby immediately calls him dad, which feels weird to me. Get away from my dad. <gasps> Wait, what? You don't wanna like have a discussion with him first, decide what titles 
y'all are okay with before just randomly springing that on him. Nah. Okay. So the family is saved, but Scrooge is still under this no adventuring contract. And the only way to break it is to find a loophole. And we get this absolute gem. Scrooge could be with his family as long as he doesn't adventure. But family is the greatest adventure of all. I love it when the sappy message gets literalized into the magic system. It's so good. The contract is null. They defeat Bradford with the power of adventure and family, and they all pack up to go home. Roll credits. Now, the finale still certainly has a lot of great stuff still in there. Huey does have slightly more focus, but Dewey and Louie in their reduced roles still feel extremely well characterized. I know I'm the hero of the Funzo's raid. No one's calling you that. But how do we know we're not walking into a foul trap here? Here. Dewey's concerned about jumping into this one blind, and he's Dewey! The humor in general is still on point. Your grandmother! Please hold all startled utterances of disbelief for the end. Of course, the show does some meta commentary about how difficult finales are, and there's even some fun foreshadowing about the final twist. Like you always said, Dad, family is the greatest footstool of all. Wow! <laughs> they really tied up everyone's storyline at the end there. Some of those fan service moments play really well. The scene where Launchpad gets to use the Gizmo Duck armor feels like a real Captain America using Thor's hammer moment. And of course, that final loophole twist. But there's just so much of it that feels messy. My main gripe is while it is a good setup for a season finale, it doesn't really feel like a series finale. Last season, we fought off a moon invasion. We went into space. We saved the world from changing orbits. This season, they all go to the desert. To a library in the desert. To fight some guys. And sure, a lot of people are there, but last season it was literally everyone. And a lot of our side characters don't have much to do either. I mean, Violet does pretty much nothing unique the whole finale, except for freak out right here. One of us is likely to fill the void and spin out in panic, but who? Who? They give Boyd the body of a little bulb, which I don't know why you would want to do that, but okay. And then when they show Penumbra for like a second, get out of here. She should have been part of the main cast for this episode. I do not accept your stupid little mini cameo. But there is a bit of a conspiracy theory floating around the fandom as to why this finale feels so weird. The rumor is that following in the focus season pattern, they had hoped for at least four seasons, one for each of our main kids. But when they didn't get renewed for a fourth season, they suddenly had to cram all of their Huey ideas and all of their Webby ideas into one season. Now, I'm not sure that that's true, but it certainly sounds plausible. If you think about it, a lot of the flaws in the finale boil down to Huey's through lines feeling very anticlimactic, not getting a large conclusion, and the Webby through lines feeling very rushed and sudden, only getting a big conclusion. On the Webby side of things, the whole May and June arc is absolutely infuriating because of how little time it has. They seem innocent, but people assume they're evil. We learn that's wrong. We should treat them as family, but then it turns out they are evil. And then, because of a speech, they decide to turn good because Fowl isn't actually their family. So then they team up with Webby and crew because... I mean, honestly, mostly just blood at this point. It's not like we've been able to build up their found family relationship. They also have yet to do anything that shows that they will not immediately turn back to being evil. If anything, we know them for largely flip-flopping at this point. They are extremely sheltered children, so they are pretty easy to manipulate. We spent a whole season dissecting Lena's conversion away from evil, and so to try and speed run it for these two in two episodes is insulting. There's just no buildup. They feel like unfinished first draft characters. Webby's characterization in the finale also feels a bit like it comes out of nowhere. She has never been this invested in her own personal history before, and her not being paranoid about the clones when they first show up seems wildly out of character. The clones are classified and I don't get to know anything about them even though they're me. 
Who wants Froyo? We have a great example of how to deal with a twist like this in the first season of the show. Dewey has a whole season of wrestling with his feelings surrounding the large family mystery. And though he's a very goofy character, with that amount of time, it's easy to ground him and make him feel layered and serious in his reaction to the situation. With Webby, we've got two and a half episodes to make that same shift and turn her into this serious linchpin for the plot. They do try building up some of the mystery earlier, but it's not especially consistent and not nearly as much as we need to have the impact that you want before the finale. On the flip side, I think this is a perfect setup for a hypothetical Huey season finale. Fowl is a great antagonist for him, Bradford specifically. Huey being seduced by the rules and logic-driven villain really makes sense. His trust in the Junior Woodchuck guidebook being twisted is a great challenge, and his brothers learning to use the guidebook in order to help save him is a great payoff. How did you guys find me? The Junior Woodchuck guidebook has the answer to everything. <gasps> As it stands though, I'm not too sure that it comes full circle into an actual arc. What is it that Huey needs to learn? Dewey needed to learn to accept the truth and trust his family. Louie needed to learn to value his talents but remain humble about them. Huey maybe needs to learn to let out his Jacqueline Hyde alternate personality one time a couple episodes before the finale. I think? It feels like this could be set up to be about questioning authority, or maybe like having confidence in your instincts, because with Bradford as a logic-driven villain, Huey would need to find other strengths to lean on in order to defeat him. As is, we've got Huey maybe following Bradford's logic before someone just tells him like, no, he's actually evil. Bradford wasn't just the first woodchuck, he was the worst woodchuck. It strikes me as particularly awkward that Bradford's big tempting offer to Huey is to get him to help Webby to help him. You know, instead of getting him to do the thing himself, join the dark side, do this thing because it is logical, it will help the greater good. And then you would get this very direct betrayal when Huey gets the papyrus, you know, the moment that Webby gets. Even though her relationship with Fowl is established like this episode and she hasn't had any bonding time with Bradford. Meanwhile, Huey's connection with the Junior Woodchucks has been established since day one with time in this episode dedicated to getting him and Bradford closer, but whatever. I mean, writing on a magical paper disappearing as Huey holds it, information being lost because of something that he did, feels like very potent imagery for Huey specifically. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Huey has all the setup, and Webby has all the payoff. It's very weird. And then Bradford's final form. It's a good solution to his arc and would have been valuable in a full Huey climax, showing him that following pure logic can turn you into a monster, but it doesn't really feel satisfying as a final villain for the whole series. Strong boy Bradford is kinda cringe. And that's kind of the point, but that also means that his main intimidation factor as a businessman who quietly controls everything diminishes as you get to the end of the finale. That isn't really what I imagine the DuckTales villain to end all DuckTales villains being. Again, season two's finale feels more final. It's a threat so big that the villains team up with the heroes. This is a pretty standard fight by all accounts. And there's also a lot of smaller aspects that seem like they're missing buildup as well. Take the Donald side plot for the finale. Donald is planning on traveling the world with Daisy in his houseboat. W what? You're leaving? Love, I... We thought we'd have our own little adventure. That's great! This is after we just saw their second date a couple episodes ago. That, to me, 
seems like a big jump. Like maybe this was their long-term plan for the couple, but would have liked an extra season to establish them in a steady relationship before they move in together and go traveling and potentially adopt a bunch more kids. Yeah, the ending implies that May and June will be joining them on their romantic tour around the world, which is crazy because they don't know them. Why would you write this in? Why would why would that be your choice? The finale also has Della interacting with Daisy in this overly friendly kind of way, and I feel like we haven't really worked up to that either. There's a season worth of development missing for Daisy in order to get her into the cast dynamic like this. I would love to see Donald and Daisy realistically get to the point where they might consider adopting some child clones. I would love to see Daisy and Della become gal pals, but currently the relationship for for one of the Fab Five has less development than Lin-Manuel Miranda's side character. Because I believe in science, but I also believe in love! All of these little pieces just feel so much like we've skipped something. Like they had the ending that they wanted in mind, and so they just crammed it all in regardless of if it fit or not. They wanted to tie up those loose ends. If nothing, the finale does end the show properly with a really cute credits sequence where all of our cast falls out of the plane and we follow them as they descend. It's a very fitting send off to the show, but again, May and June are there. They are part of the special bunch that gets to be celebrated as part of the McDuck family. And it really puts a damper on things for me. Any future content in this universe has to account for them. They are now a part of the DuckTales 2017 lore. They are a core part of this universe, no matter how much it feels like they aren't. Same with the Webby Twist. This new weird factoid that was added at the last possible minute is now forever on the show's wiki page. Canon to every piece of media attached to this timeline, retroactively reflecting on old content in the show. That, feels wrong to me. No, you didn't earn your place here. You were not a part of my three season show. You were bonus content. You were what should have been a scrapped concept that we found out about in interviews. And yet here you are displayed as a prominent part of the universe in the end credits of the show. This animation, just this little bit of animation here, feels like the show is gaslighting me. May and June were always core to the cast. Didn't it feel so incomplete before they showed up? They were always going to be here. Don't you remember? No, no, I don't. This is not it. You know, that Darkwing episode about creator backlash? is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy now. Of all of the loose ends the finale was able to tie up, the cliffhanger at the end of that episode, the one about being driven mad by unresolved cliffhangers, that was never given any sort of follow-up. It remains an unresolved cliffhanger. And the creator's obsession with a perfect ending introduced this episode. Their insistence that they tie up all the loose ends, even the ones that hadn't been revealed to be loose yet. That mindset is ultimately what gave me the exact feelings about the show that it seems like they were trying to avoid. I now have some hard feelings that are difficult to get rid of. This is not my DuckTales. I look like such a 10 year old boy in this outfit, but I guess that's the intention. 